Hello, welcome. I'm Joshua Sparrow at the Browselton Touchpoint Center, and this is Learning to Listen, Conversations for Change. To find out more about the Braselton Touchpoint Center and Learning to Listen, just go to braseltontouchpoints.org and click on Learn with Us. There you can look for Learning to Listen in the Conversations section. There's also a link there to our archive of Learning to Listen Conversations over the past four years. To learn more about and register for more Brazelton Touchpoint Center conversations, events, and trainings, click on the Brazelton Touchpoints catalog link in the chat. To join the Brazelton Touchpoint Center's learning network, look for the braseltontouchpoints.org learning network link in the chat. And if you are able and would like to help us continue to make programming like Learning to Listen free and available to all, please look for the donate link, link in the chat or the donate page at braseltontouchpoints.org backslash donate. Any amount, whatever you can do that would feel good for you is a huge help. Thank you for joining us. Today, we will be listening to Makiba McCreary, president of the New Commonwealth Racial Equity and Social Justice Fund, and August, Augusta Meal, executive director at Agency, a human-centered design firm. In a moment, you'll have a chance to learn about a vision for a world without racism and to find out why we are so honored to have them both with us today. But first, a bit of information about today's Learning to Listen episode. Over 2,100 people have registered for today's webinar, and it's great to see you in the chat. So please do tell us who you are and where you're from and what you do. Today, our terrific interpreter, Maria Jose Gutierrez, joining us from Bogota, Colombia, 
we'll be simultaneously translating our webinar into Spanish. Thank you, Maria Jose. To access the translation, click on the interpretation icon in your Zoom controls, then select Spanish. To mute the English in the background, select Mute Original Audio. La conversación de hoy será en español e inglés. En los controles de esa reunión, haga clic en Interpretación. Haga clic en el idioma que le gustaría escuchar. Para, escu para escuchar solo el español, haga clic en Silenciar Audio Original. We are also providing closed captions today for those who would like to use them. To turn captioning on, please click on the closed caption icon in your Zoom controls and select Show Subtitle. You can adjust the size of the subtitles. Please use the chat feature if you have a comment to share or need help with a technical issue. Please put your questions in the Q&A box, and we will try to pause a few times along the way to respond to them. Now, we know many of you will be looking for your certificate of attendance. If you would like to receive a certificate of attendance for today's webinar, please do be sure you complete the feedback survey. That feedback survey will open in your web browser when this webinar ends. You will also receive a link to that same survey tomorrow in our thank you email to you that will also include a link to the webinar recording as well as resources about today's conversation. That survey and the webinar recording will be available in both English and Spanish. You can also access the recordings on our YouTube channel and our BrasseltonTouchPoints.org website. Before we begin, I want to thank our sponsor, the Burke Foundation, which funds transformative prenatal to early childhood initiatives that help unlock the full potential of children, families, and their communities. I also want to thank our wonderful Brazelton Touchpoint Center production team. They make it all possible, Isabella Mantilla, Ashley Gaddis, Michael Accardi, and Suzanne Okasik. And now, let me introduce today's guests, Makiba McCreary and Augusta Meal. Augusta Meal is the director of the nonprofit design firm Agency, and yes, it's A-G-N-C-Y without an E. Working in the systems of education, healthcare, and criminal justice, much of Agency's work is focused on disenfranchised communities across Boston. I will pause there because apparently it takes several words to translate disenfranchised into Spanish. Agency merges the design process with the philosophy of community organizing, seeking to redistribute power, create coalitions, and develop solutions that align incentives and values between community members and institutions. You can find out more at agency.org. And again, that's agncy.org, no E. Makiba Mercury is president of the New Commonwealth Racial Equity and Social Justice Fund. NCF, we'll call it, was founded by black and brown executives from Massachusetts leading corporations to support black and brown communities amid the COVID-19 pandemic and in the wake of the brutal killing by police of George Floyd. In its first year, NCF raised $30 million towards its initial fundraising goal of $100 million to be used to support eligible nonprofit organizations and build an ecosystem of leaders and stakeholders committed to dismantling systemic racism in Boston and across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Prior to joining the NCF, the New Commonwealth Racial Equity and Social Justice Fund, Makiba McCurry was a senior leader at the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and served as managing director and senior advisor of external affairs for Boston Public Schools, reporting directly to the mayor and superintendent of schools. Makiba and Augusta, thank you so much for joining us today and for your important work and your vision. Let's start with you, Makiba, uh, so that you can set the table for all of us. Thank you. Okay, I found my all my buttons. Um, first, it's just a pleasure to to join you for this conversation. Um, 
but also even more of a pleasure to get to do it with Augusta, who has been a, a longtime partner of mine um, across many organizations. Um, and so um, this has been a, a lot of fun and we love to talk about our work together. Um, so the new Commonwealth Fund is really a startup. Um, we are just gonna be about three years old in June. Um, and when I joined um, just almost two years ago, um, there was very little in place, very little infrastructure in place. Um, but uh, one of the things I did that I thought was quite smart um, is I asked a whole bunch of really amazing philanthropic leaders to tell me what I didn't know, to tell me what they wish they had, what they wish they could do, um, give me their best advice. Um, and the one thing that they all resoundingly said to me was, you have not inherited um, a system that tells you how to make grants, how to measure success, how to um, evaluate the right um, organization um, and so many other things. And so don't create them unnecessarily. But to be honest, um, you know, the, the, the charge to raise a hundred million dollars is a big one. And so I um, very quickly knew that I was gonna have to be able to answer the question for a donor how will you know that you have dismantled systemic racism? How are you going to measure that? Um, and my my gut reaction, my knee jerk reaction was, oh, you know, I'll I'll make a rubric, I'll design something, I can do that, you know, easily. I have the background. And then I I paused and I took what one of our colleagues calls an uh, calls an, an equity pause, and I said to myself, you know, remember the advice you got. How do you actually really deconstruct this, the approach, the methodology to evaluation with a racial justice lens? Um, how do you ensure that you don't just start to perpetuate the same kind of imbalance of um, um, judgment around what is successful, what is working, what is worth more investment um, than your colleagues who don't have a lot of choice? They can't sort of start from scratch. So. Um, I reached out to about 20 um, nonprofit leaders in our portfolio, some of them not in our portfolio, all black and brown, and invited them to work with us for six months. And myself and Augusta and a third colleague, Tali Germain, who's with an incredible organization called Onward, we co-facilitated um, for those six months. Um, we, we paid everybody for their time, um, asked them for a day a month. and we suspended um, an expectation of what the outcome would be. Um, and that wasn't always comfortable. Um, and each session we learned something new and we became really close um, as a, a team of folks. I think um, we sort of, I know I miss those, those sessions um, sometimes. And um, we ended up creating what we call now the disruption deck, um, disruption cards. And there's, I do have a, hard copy, an analog version here. Um, and then there's also um, a website version that I think we'll show, share with you um, at some point today. Um, and what it essentially allows an organization to do is decide after the grant has been made, what kind of relationship they're gonna have with us and where they're gonna ask us to push in and be supportive and help them get to whatever their next touch point is of what they've decided success looks like. Um, and we did that by naming what racism is, by naming where it persists in all of our work, um, by coming to some shared agreements about definition. Um, and um, so if you go onto the website, everything you see is absolutely co-created. Um, we listened intently. Um, we scribed for folks, but really for the most part, um, we were just receiving the content and organizing it and taking it back out to them to say, did we get this right? And we had to do that a few times. Um, and um, we were we were lucky enough to, to think about documenting the process. Um, and so we have a, a mini documentary to share that will give you the perspective of the participants in going through this this six months of work together.
two of you and also watching y'all work together is so amazing because you know it's hard to hold makiba down tell her look you can't come to this session you said that i was like yo you going in right like when i joined the new commonwealth fund um i had the privilege of inviting i'd say like 15 colleagues to come join me for what we call the charrette and um both of these guys joined me for that. And also a number of other people leading pretty large philanthropic entities across the country. And one of the things that they said to me was, do not lose the option that you have of um, not falling into the same traps that we don't have the, the ability to relinquish. So what does that mean? You don't have a board of trustees that's, you know, 30 people deep and bylaws that have been in play for 50 years. You don't have a family legacy that you are you know, supporting, you don't have to buy into um, all of the constructs of what uh, traditional philanthropy typically puts forward. For example, um, what does success look like? How do you measure success? What does um, impact mean? And I really, that really resonated for me and I held on to it up until the point where we were ready to start to think about whether the previous rounds of grants had made a difference. What, what was that, you know, how are we gonna be able to tell that story. What we do is we co-construct the answer with the individuals for whom that answer is most important. That led to me inviting 20 nonprofit leaders, some of them in our portfolio, but some who weren't, just to be able to bring in some new voices. And I was meeting such incredible um, individuals from across the Commonwealth, across all five pillars. Um, and we um, asked if they would be willing to work with us. It was uncomfortable because it was not clear. And like we always are walking through an ambiguous process, but usually our client is attempting to like put an end point to it. And oftentimes we get called um, because there is an outcome that they want to get to. I think traditional philanthropy pushes us to define success on someone else's terms. Um, it's typically very oriented towards how a for-profit business might run. It's typically oriented towards uh, the ideas that those in power hold about uh, not just what's wrong and also what they believe is possible. What NCF is doing is, is so radically different in the sense that they're really starting with the people who are doing the work. They're letting them guide the process for how grant making should happen. The very foundation of philanthropy is challenging and broken because it's rooted in capitalism and lack of access, right? So I think fundamentally we know that that is like problematic. And protecting wealth. And, and protecting wealth, right? right? And also the, the sort of um, ratio of giving to keeping is not like, um, does not resonate. In the fifth session, we had a matrix, essentially. And somebody said, this is not circular in the way that our work is. Right. And it was this, um, for me, an aha moment that we need to build it in a way that invites people in from a multitude of directions. And so, um, like, breaking up the structure so it becomes more flexible for folks. Yeah. I think this process has changed how we're engaging with philanthropy because there's a real uh, sense of partnership. I feel like a partner of NCF. I feel like a, not just a recipient of, of a grant, but a thought partner, um, you know, bi-directional. I think that there's, um, even beyond what we have access to philanthropically, those who are in foundations have access to, um, to transferring the asset. And I'm really down for, you know, ongoing partnership and conversation about how we make uh, investments that really democratize access to resources that have been inequitably distributed in the past. I think this process has given me uh, unreasonable confidence <laughs> where if I look at the philanthropic landscape, if I have to compromise uh, my integrity, my organization's integrity for the sake of dollars, I'm not gonna be moved to do that, especially because I know I have supporters like NCF. I think the other thing um, as we talk about philanthropy is how it is rooted in white dominant paradigms in colonialism, right? Which inherently maintains a power structure, does not provide access, and is transactional. I think fundamentally the way we started our work and what we've been doing 
is sort of the antithesis of all of those things. Often funders' uh, relationships can feel very top down. Uh, this has feel, felt like collaboration. Um, we are working through what evaluation should look like together. We are talking about impact, uh, both individual and collective. Um, we are um, in spaces together where we are exploring what it means to rest and what joy looks like um, in our own lives and in making sure that that is also a priority for us. It also gives us space to be imaginative, to think big. Uh, and to sit in a mindset of abundance. One of the things you talk about is an antidote to white supremacist culture is um, being explicit about like the unwritten, mm -hmm. under the surface things. And I learned a lot from watching you do that throughout the process where you'd like in the moment of a group, you'd say, wait, hold on, Zoom's not doing this thing or the energy's not here or what have you. And just really being um, totally open and totally uh, normalizing, um, making explicit kind of the back end of stuff. And uh, I took a lot from that, so I appreciate it. Agree. It tells you that NCF is about the work, that NCF is about convening doers. It's not just about talk. It's not just about conversations. It's about bringing people in the room who are truly connected to and embedded in the community, who are already doing the work. When we remove uh, the numbers game from the process and start to talk about the uh, impact on communities, on, on, on individuals as uh, redefining success. I think that's where we, we are starting to talk about uh, shifts. And then um, simultaneously, uh, NCF has pushed us in thinking about ecosystems to think about how the work that we do um, as an individual organization actually impacts other sectors. Um, and other sort of uh, facets of our respective communities that, again, in the end, supports everyone. We know about our work. We know what success looks like. We know how to get there. But like very few funders ever ask us, like, well, how would you measure success? Like, what are your metrics that you think are important? That, that, and that's just frustrating. One, because we work hard and we apply a lot of rigor to the work that we do. Um, but two, because it's setting me up to not be successful. You know, the both the time horizon and the kind of prescribed metrics that must be met, um, that is a, a pain point. It's yeah. a bottleneck. It's a place where many, um, you know, many really great projects with great leaders go to die. Allowing a, an organization to define what what they view as success in 18 months, mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. what's really possible yeah. in 18 months? Um, and then, you know, what, the metrics, like how many people did your organization touch? Like, or did you, did you interact with? Like, is that success? This idea that we show up in the ways we want the world to show up, right? is actually extremely empowering and affirming of people's identities. Like I walk in and I see me, right? And that is so rare in the world. I think we have these, what I would call equity pauses, mm. where we're like, are we defaulting to what has been, which is totally normal because we're wired to do that. We've been in these spaces and we were checking ourselves. Right. And we didn't need anyone to check us because we created these sort of anchors yeah. that allowed us to do that. We built a model to start addressing the need and addressing these questions. Mm -hmm. And that model continues to grow, but the, the work kind of never stops. It's yeah. going to continue and continue to refine. It, it goes a step beyond for us, by us, but like also asks us to think really critically about what are those needs? Can we use this? And I think one of the things I really liked about this process um, within the last session was the sort of like, all right, let's try to pressure test this thing right now and see how it goes. And some of us were left scratching our heads and some of us were like, oh, I would zig and zag and I would sort of tweak this. And even I think Makiba was like, oh, you know what? I think we should do this. And so we know we're not done with the work, um, but at least we get to evaluate it and set the metrics and set our need. And that's been, that's been really wonderful. You bring out my genius and my courage and my bravery, which makes me a better leader, better person, better partner, right? And like, there's a way that NCF, I believe has done that for our participants. And that's been extremely valuable for me. That's why I say like, I learned more than I gave. You know, what I gave was sort of marginal compared to like what I got. It's something that's never been done. I think it's something that's revolutionary. And I think it's a model. It involves those who need to be involved, those who are like traditionally not involved in the process. 
And to me, that's the way things get done because, I mean, um, the people who are always involved in the process never got it done right, so. I think um, I only see it uh, now in one way, and that's the new Commonwealth fun way, you know? And I think that uh, seeing it in that way uh, will shape and mold uh, things for me and my agency going forward, so, yeah. yeah. You know, philanthropy is not a monolith. And maybe that's the other thing we need to stop doing is talking about philanthropy as if it is all of these things that we don't want to be because in some ways we're reinforcing that that's, a, that that's got a lot of power. Sometimes I think traditional philanthropy is punitive. You didn't do it this way, this right way that we've prescribed, you get no more funding. And so people then have to do this song and dance, right? They have to um, monetize their trauma, mm. right? They have to like focus on shame or the, the things that aren't working in their communities rather than the genius that they are. There's an opportunity for fellow colleagues who are in the business of resourcing nonprofits to start to think about language, to start to think about investment as opposed to grantees, start to think about respect versus trust, um, and to start to think about themselves as having a different role from the one that they may have walked into um, at the very start. And get, being have, giving permission to themselves to, to have that shift. I think that individuals don't realize how much they can influence an institution. Um, and so I think we, we maybe have also opened that door too. Thank you so much for bringing that video to us and all those good people. Um, thank you so much for this groundbreaking work. Um, my old friend Brenda Blazingame asked um, where um, she can watch the video again, and Augusta has put uh, the link in the chat. It's newcommonwealthfund.org backslash impact, and um, there are thank yous and appreciations. And uh, a couple of questions. Uh, there was one comment, unrealistic confidence, love it. And then a question for um, both of you, perhaps. How to navigate thought partnership with a power differential that can exist with a funder? Sure, um, yeah, I'm happy to jump in. And just um, on that site, the same place where the video is, right next to it is a link to the um, website that we've built that has the deck of uh, cards there. And it um, is very interactive. I, I found out the other day that that's not intuitive. So just know that as you scroll down, there are things that you can move around and, and flip over and um, please play with it. Um, I also should mention that they were um, actually designed by three different uh, artists of color from um, Massachusetts, Aqua Holmes, Rob Gibbs, and um, uh, Marquise Victor, who was in the video, who has coined unreasonable confidence. We love that. Um, and so, the, I, you know, I, my two cents in terms of sort of how you do that is you pay very close attention. Um, you um, leave yourself a lot of grace to always remind yourself that you need to step back and step uh, out. Um, as a woman of color, I made some assumptions about being in a room with leaders of color um, that somehow that power differential would just be mitigated by me saying, hey, I'm here just like you. And um, it wasn't, it wasn't. And there were many, many times when 
we had to pause. There was a time when we had to, um, somebody asked, um, when we fill out this assessment, if we score really well, does that mean we'll have access to funding from the new Commonwealth Fund? And it was in that moment that I was reminded, um, oh, wait, everybody in this room is still like a little bit performing, you know, for, for us. Um, and so I made a decision in that moment that we will never use the cards in a relationship until after the money had exchanged hands um, to just really reinforce that this is not, um, this is not us um, using as a tool to um, pass judgment you know, on, your, on the efficacy of your organization. Um, I don't know, Augusta, if you have any recollections or thoughts. I think you covered it. There was um, one other question, if I understand it correctly. As a mental health clinician of a nonprofit under budget cut pressure, um, what could we do or think differently based on what you've learned from your work? I think that's what the question was. I think I can start, Makiba, if you want. Um, I think one of the things that um, the uh, that I learned from the leaders that we worked with is um, the opportunity to approach um, work that can be really challenging with an abundance mindset, um, and that oftentimes there is a lot of um, uh, a lot of deficit framing, a lot of scarcity um, scarcity based approach. Uh, to philanthropy and funding and the even the way that um, opportunities are framed. Um, and this is not to negate the real constraints and the challenges that exist within organizations, like it sounds like yours. Um, but I think there is some mindset shift that can be unlocked um, and certainly design can be part of that process. Did you want to add, Makiba? I just would double click on the idea around abundance. I think We've done a lot of work and continue to um, into two very simple places, uh, spaces. One is around language, um, how we choose to define um, the folks we work with. We work really hard not to say grantee um, and to say leader. We work hard not to say that we're giving out grants and we say we're making investments. This triggers a different um, part of your brain, I think, when you... Uh, do some inquiry into the language you've adopted and continue to use in your practice. Um, and I think we all can do that. I mean, you know, it's a constant um, exercise that's really healthy. Um, and I think the other thing that Augusta said that I, I wanted to repeat is this idea that um, we are so uh, trained to frame the place we're going um, around the problem we're trying to solve. And um, that immediately starts to put us into a cycle of sort of trauma, um, constantly describing our work, the people that we are serving, the organizations we're partnering with, all in the frame of what's broken, you know, what's missing, what's painful. Um, and so I, I would encourage um, the practice of thinking about what is possible. Um, what will be opened up and unlocked if, you know, if enough resources are able to flow and not always just dollar resources. Sometimes it's also, um, there's other resources that people need. Um, and um, yeah, that's what I would, I would offer that. Thank you both. Um, I have questions for you too, but I'm not going to indulge myself and <laughs> turn it back to you, Augusta, to, um, take us through your human-centered um, process, which I uh, imagine will build on the really beautiful answer that you both gave to a really hard and important question. Thanks. Um, and yeah, keep keep popping the questions in the Q&A um, and we will uh, pause and answer more again. Um, Isabella, if you don't mind putting the presentation up, um, I thought I would share a few principles sort of behind the scenes of that process that you heard about um, that can exemplify or um, share with you um, some of the elements of human-centered design that were embodied in that work. And if you'd go to the next sli slide, please. Um, uh, the 
title of this, I believe, was human-centered design, but really what I think we're here to share about is equity-centered design. And I think a lot of us are familiar with this framing of moving from um, inequ inequity uh, in which there is not um, access for all to equality in which the same is provided to all, um, to equitable access in which um, access is provided to uh, ensure that populations that are traditionally excluded or for whom barriers are highest are able to gain access. And what um, my team and I are doing at agency and with partners like Makiba and this um, beautiful group of leaders is to actually move towards equitable design where we're thinking about um, not only access to, this, to establish offerings, but really reshaping those offerings um, by, with, and for um, those, those populations. Um, so on the next slide, and then actually the next one after that, I'm going to offer you three principles today. Um, the first one is around valuing expertise. Um, I don't know, Isabel, if you catch this in the chat, if there's any way to make the images larger, because uh, the font's too small. And I think you're going to send this out afterwards. Um, so if people want to read it in detail, you will get it. Um, uh, design as a problem-solving approach um, it honors a range of forms of expertise and data, um, forms that are often not seen uh, in traditional ways of working. When we look at um, systems of racism, what we see is that they value some particular types of expertise. You know, we do a lot of work in healthcare. In healthcare, if you have certain letters after your name, this indicates a specific type of expertise. And this can be limiting when we think about what are those solutions solutions that can unlock um, new possibilities um, and can result in a distance um, from end users that further concentrates power um, in this closed loop. So in our work, you see, you know, a physician who has those letters after her name working with a caregiver with um, deep, deep expertise in her child and her beliefs around what it means to raise that child well, when they're able to share that expertise, it, um, it's transformative. Um, if you'd go to the next slide, please. Um, design um, methods that we use um, are things like what you see here. This is my colleague, Candice, um, interviewing an early childhood educator. Um, and the design approach um, really honors those lived experiences and understands that what that woman knows is something that folks at the district office um, cannot know because she has experiences and proximity and expertise. She is sitting in the tiny chair and she knows what that feels like in ways that folks at central office do not. On the next slide, um, we also do this work in really generative exploratory ways. This is a group of um, court involved young people. And what they're doing on that like beautiful messy table is imagining new possibilities for their community. And this sort of community led design um, shifts the power of the design process. So it's, it is held by community rather than by the folks who are traditionally holding decision-making. Um, and so they're, they're developing um, solutions and ideas in partnership with the district attorney's office. And I think you saw Marquise on the next slide there, the equity outcome of this is a power shift. You know, we love that unreasonable confidence and that confidence grounded in values um, and the assets of Marquise and his organization. The next principle on the next slide that I wanted to share is this idea of the power of design to create shared visions. Um, like Makiba was saying in, in this work, it's often about what are we moving away from you know, what, what do we need to fix? What is the broken thing? And design has the possibility to flip that script and to say, no, what is the future we are moving towards? What is the aspiration we are collectively building together? Um, because, and uh, because systems of racism um, hold often dominant views of success, singular views of success that are um, grounded in these, these legacies um, and that are often very, uh, very limiting. Um, and this uh, work to create shared visions is, um, provides the opportunity to um, entertain and hold uh, new views of what success can mean. If you'd go to the next slide, thank you. Um, we, um, 
We find in design that we have opportunities to provide this scaffolding to imagine new alternatives. And a design process gives us a chance to, um, as the person in the chat said around budget cuts, you know, we understand that there are constraints today and working with a design methodology can provide us freedom with those from those constraints for a, lim a little bit of time so that we can do that dreaming and that imagining. Um, if you, in many planning processes in this chart on this slide, we work forward from what we know today. We say, based on where we are now, where do we think we can get next semester or next quarter or next school year? On the next slide, um, what we do in our design work is we instead say, where do we want to get to? What is that vision that we want to build towards? And then on the following slide, um, uh, backcast from that to think about based on that vision, where can we go next? And it changes the trajectory um, of an organization or a systems um, work. And on the next slide, um, that vision in our work is, is always set by um, a deep, grounding in the experiences of people. Um, this like crazy little storyboard there is work that we did with an elementary school. Um, this is one of the educators storyboarding out um, all of the transition moments for her K-1 students, right? Thinking about what are the really critical moments during the school day for them? It's about those moments of transition. And if I can design, design those um, with my students in mind, that can start to build that vision. And on the next slide, um, design also um, as a process um, builds engagement around shared visions so that folks can see themselves and find themselves in the work, um, regardless of where in the ecosystem you might sit. If you'd go to the next slide, please. Um, this is a piece that we did with um, the education ecosystem in Boston. Um, creating a shared um, vision for what we want high school students to know and to be able to do when they leave high school. And um, often these sort of visions of the graduate come to life as like a bullet point list of skills or competencies. And you can see um, even at a glance that this comes to life as a narrative. This was built like six years ago. And this week I talked to somebody who said, oh, you know, the backpack, the kid with the backpack, like this is a sticky story that, that folks can see themselves in and can see their work in and design has that power also. Um, if you'd go to the next slide, please. Um, oh, and we heard this in um, when Edie said, um, I think of this now in the new Commonwealth Fund way, right? Like that this, the equity opportunity in this work of, um, of visioning is the opportunity to, um, to create these new views of impact, new views of success. And in doing that, um, I think that's also about the unlearning of um, the definitions that we have to some extent normed ourselves to um, as folks who are all operating within a system from one extent or another. Um, I miss Edie seeing her like that. Um, the third uh, principle that I wanted to share with you is um, the emphasis on conditions. Um, in, in our work, what we say is we don't design hearts and minds, we design conditions. And by designing the structures, the tools, the processes, this is what influences system behaviors. And um, we can identify points of leverage where design can have, um, have real muscle. Um, and the reason why we, we work in this way is because in systems of racism, we see that the system behaves differently for different people, right? And I think that there's an inside version of that and an outside version of that um, based on the individualism um, that systems in America have been built around. Um, what we see on the, on the inside is that there are like, you all know this, nobody goes into education with evil in their heart wanting to, um, you know, enact oppression. They go in with the desire to help and serve and support and often are faced with a lack of structure or support that ena enables them to do that job um, consistently and to the um, degree that they might wish. And on the 
external side, um, what we also see is what we sometimes call the squeaky wheel syndrome, where the, the voices that are enfranchised, the voices that are, um, are uh, confident and empowered are the ones that are heard and seen. And so this focus on conditions is one of the ways that we use design um, to shift that dynamic. If you'd go to the next slide, please. Um, that the power I think that design has here is in bridging those human perspectives with a, um, a systems view, right? And um, the method that I'm bringing forward here is the idea of system mapping um, as a way to help um, illuminate and frame those, those ecosystem issues um, in ways that are still very human centered. And I think that some of the power of system mapping is that it can help us um, take what can seem like a too big, too insurmountable, too above my pay grade issue and identify those points of lever, leverage and find um, um, our own power and influence in that change work. Like Makiba said in the video, like an individual does have the, the, the ability to influence an institution. And on the next slide, what I brought to share with you is a, a set of mapping um, that we did with the city of Boston. Um, this is mapping the city's response to uh, shooting. When a person is shot in Boston, it activates um, this ecosystem of providers that come from a range of perspectives, state, city, um, medical, nonprofit, education, um, housing, et cetera. And um, what I won't explain in this whole diagram, but what you see here is what the, um, the map of the services that are provided to a family of a person who has been fatally shot. And just imagine those little lit up circles are the services that those, that those families receive. On the next slide, what you see is a map of a family of a person who has been shot and who survives. And this is of course not an insignificant difference, but we also know that that family is experiencing trauma, is experiencing um, potential safety questions, has, has needs um, around the follow-up and follow-through of their um, healing and care. And so a, a map like this helps reveal sort of where the difference is from a system level, um, from a human perspective. And I think on the next slide, um, some of the equity possibility in that, um, I hear when I hear Dawn say, um, this goes beyond for us, by us, but she said something like it asks us to think critically um, about what we need. And I think this is an example of that um, conditions work um, influencing um, behaviors and prompting those questions in a way that um, doesn't, doesn't remove care, doesn't remove autonomy, but, um, but influences. And so those, those are the three principles I brought uh, to share with you. I'd love to answer any questions that you have if Josh, anything has come up. Well, let me first um, congratulate um, Maria Jose Gutierrez in Bogota, Colombia, because um, people are um, very grateful for your excellent um, interpretation. So I just want to start there. Um, thank you, Maria Jose. And um, there are a number of comments. People really want to learn how to um, do this system mapping. People are thinking about how they could use it as um, the grant funding season um, approaches. So I don't know if if you you might have more to say, Augusta, about how people can learn more about this approach and in ways perhaps in which you might be um, able to um, uh, direct them towards um, supports to build on this work? Um, I wish that there was like a one-stop shop where I could send you. Um, I'm, I'm uh, like, I am a resource and consider me part of your network. Um, so feel free to, feel free to use me as that resource. Um, I think a lot of the system mapping um, resources that are available tend to be from a systems perspective rather than from a human-centered design perspective. Um, so as you're reading up about it or, or, or investigating it, I would just encourage you to do that and then put a hard lens of, um, of that voice of the, the human at the other end of that service, um, whoever that might be in whatever role you're serving. Can you say more about the distinction you're making between human-centered 
design versus a systems approach? Um, there, <laughs> um, systems map, there's this, uh, there's a systems mapping example. Um, it's a famous PowerPoint that was presented during um, the Iraq war. And um, one of the government leaders said, when we understand that PowerPoint slide, we will have won the war. Um, and system mapping has this tendency, I think, to be technically true and also um, obfuscating uh, and removed from like the human, the ground level um, human reality. And so what we do is we often are collecting data and information of all types from a system level. Um, and then as we analyze it and think about what are the axes that we want to map against, that's where we bring the um, sort of like quote unquote end user perspective. We have um, a question about your thoughts on combining system mapping and um, client or family journey mapping, which is a specific approach. Um, yeah, I think that that, I mean, that might be a good, a good avenue into, that might be a good bridge between the human-centered side and the system side. Um, there's certainly times where we use a, um, in this case, like a family experience journey map as the lens through which we see the system, right? Because um, a system can be viewed from many perspectives and looking at it explicitly through that, through that lens can be a helpful um, vantage point. We, we have a question about um, the disruption cards, which I know you wanted to get to next. So before I bring you that question, let me turn to you, Makiba, to see um, what you might want to add to um, what Augusta has um, just told us. Um, you know, Augusta, I was thinking about our one of our first projects together at Boston Public Schools when we were trying to figure out how to convince 50,000 families that you know, their little sweet schoolhouse in their neighborhood really needed to, you know, have a full overhaul. Um, and so it was a real, it was a systems issue at, at hand, which is you know, this huge shift from, you know, old to, to future, something that people really couldn't even visualize. Um, and um, so it was, and it was really about hearts, however, like it wasn't, there was nothing terribly logical about the idea that you didn't want to have your child have access to technology in their classroom. Um, but they didn't want to lose this other thing for fear of, of um, they didn't want to move towards that for fear of losing something else. And so what Augusta and her team did with us is we, we um, ended up having an open house. So it was very experiential and it was very like tactical, but they built dioramas that were life-size dioramas of what a future classroom might look like. That they were, however, very sort of cartoonish, if you would, like non-threatening. Um, I shouldn't say cartoonish, the artist was incredible, but not necessarily um, photographs or like, you know, they were they were drawings um, of, of people and kind of caricatures. Um, and it was really, I think it was really successful. F people came through for two days and just got a chance to experience not only like the budget process and how that maps out, but also walk into a classroom um, and think about where their child might be in 10 years um, if they have access to this kind of a space um, and this kind of relationship with a, an educator. So um, I'm not sure if that's Augusta, if that rings true for you as an example of the systems and the um, human-centered design piece coming through, but. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like how I remember doing that work and thinking about like, how can we tell the story of a very complex system that is the Boston Public School District um, in a way that um, that speaks to what, what a family's concerns and priorities are. So, um, if it's okay with you, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about the disruption cards. The question was, what do they look like and how can this approach be implemented within businesses and communities that are rooted in power and stuck in their ways? What does it look like in action? Um, so maybe that will be your way of bringing us to the cards. There they are. Well, that's a big question, that second one. I think we can start with the first one. We might need another webinar for the second half of that, but we would invite you to, to, to 
to think about answering that um, and with your own terms. Um, do you wanna, you can move forward. Um, um, so, and I know we're short on time, so I will make this as quick as possible. Um, one of the things that we started with was, um, as I mentioned earlier, naming where each of the leaders work intersects with structural racism. And sometimes it's more than one level, but we call these the levels. And so the first level is personal. And this artist is Maclena Gomes. She um, is from um, Boston, the Boston area. The next slide, you can move forward, is um, going to help you understand how we defined structural racism at the personal level. And we named that it was weaponized fatigue. Um, and all of these definitions you can find on the website um, as well. So you can go forward. The next level was community. Um, and then you can move forward again for the definition of weaponized stereotypes. And weapon because we want we really wanted to maintain the truth that racism is violence. Racism is um, it puts people in fear for um, their their safety, um, their family's safety, their future, their children. Um, and so that's where the word weapon comes from. The next level is institution. And here we talk about weaponized culture. Um, and then the final level is policy and that is weaponized opacity. And you can think about weaponized opacity and weaponized fatigue at the two ends of this, the, the spectrum. Um, I think for me, like weaponized fatigue sort of hits me in the gut. Weaponized opacity makes me really angry because I think about all of the de deliberate ways that our systems have made um, uh, solutions inaccessible. You can go forward. And then we pushed towards what is what does the world look like when these things are interrupted, when this is removed? Um, and frankly, it came down to three things and it felt very simple and yet very full at the same time. Um, transparency and accountability. The next one is shared narratives. Um, and then the final one was empowered communities. Um, and so I leave you, you know, with those sort of three concepts to think about what you should know is that with the cards, when you get to the cards that start to talk about empowered communities at the personal level or shared narratives at the policy level, there is no mention of racism. There is no mention of weaponization. There is no mention of um, anything that is broken or um, obstructive. It's really only about what is possible and what we want to push towards. That's my quick version. Augusta, I don't know if there's anything that you wanted to add in. Do you want to move? Is there another slide? I don't remember. Yeah, I thought so. Okay. We have, we can, we can go on and on. There's quite a bit to cover, but that was the simple version. Did you um, have more that you wanted to add, Augusta, to Mickey's no. version? <laughs> to Mickey's point, we could talk about this for, for another hour, but I think um, she covered it well. One, one of the things that um, you said to me is that um, when people start looking at the cards, there's a lot of thinking and reflecting and um, a learning to do together um, to actually use them. They they don't necessarily, you know, have all of the instructions in them. They're they're prompts for thinking and reflection and coming together and and wondering. So I am going to um, wrap this up simply by reading one of the comments. Um, in the chat, um, <laughs> which said, what an amazing conversation. I cannot tell you how grateful I am for spending time with both of these speakers. So intelligent, visionary, and humble. Thank you. Um, that, um, <laughs> that says it really well, I think. Um, and there um, are some um, hopes for more conversations with you. And um, Akiba, when you said that would take a whole other <laughs> conversation, I think that opened the door to um, the next one. So I want to thank you again 
both for this wonderful gift of being with us today and also for all of the work that you've done with these really good people and really important um, uh, communities and um, the video and the cards that now will be resources for us all. And I also wanted to thank you for um, always bringing us back to um, the frame of abundance and of what is possible and um, of going beyond dismantling racism to envisioning what a world um, without racism can be and helping us um, figure out how to come together to get there. Thank you so much. So uh, people keep on asking about the survey and the certificates of attendance and all of the wonderful resources that you shared today. So I just want to remind everyone that you will receive an email thanking you for joining us today, tomorrow, that will have links to the survey, which will get you your certificate of attendance, and also with links uh, for the video and the cards. To learn more about and register for more Brasselton Touchpoint Center conversations, again, you can click on the Brasselton Touchpoints catalog link in the chat, and you can also uh, learn more about the Brasselton Touchpoints Learning Network by clicking on the Brasselton Touchpoints Learning Network link in the chat. And we hope you'll all um, take a look at our national virtual forum, which is all about fathers and the men and children's lives, uh, which will take place virtually during the first week of May, May 2nd through 4th, through the 4th. Again, thank you so much for joining us. Be well.